Well, congratulations on the film, and thank you so much thank for taking the time to to talk to us today. Yeah, how how are how are you doing with everything? It's been a it's a strange a strange time for everyone. How are you doing with everything and and writing? I mean, is it a good a good thing that you're at home and you're able to sit and write? Or it, it yeah, lockdown's been good for me as a writer. Um, I'm I'm just kind of sad that my film is coming out at a time when you know only two men and a dog can go into a cinema. So uh, I would love people to see it in the cinema, but I guess most people will see it streaming and that's okay. Yeah, is that, is that, a, is that a strange, obviously, I, I, like you say, you want people to see it in the cinema, but it's a, a strange time. But are you, are you just glad that people are going to get the option to, to see it? Because some people do want to go back to the cinema and some yeah. people do want to do want to stay yeah. at home and watch it. I, 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 I am glad. I mean, it's, it's funny because it's, it's a small film. It's a very, you know, only three people and people talking. And so you think, well, why do you need to see it on, on a wide screen? But actually, we shot it with anamorphic lenses. So the frame is very big. <clears throat> and the effect of that is, it's, it, I, I love it. It's, it's a kind of combination of intimacy and power. Because the depth of field, it's a little bit technical, the depth of field is so specific. You can make faces exist in spaces in a very powerful way. And you see that best, to be honest, projected on a big cinema screen. However, it's the kind of film that'll do very, very well also on your home TV. So, uh, I, you know, I, I'm just glad it's getting a release. You know, it's not that easy these days. Yeah, there's a lot of films that aren't aren't being released, which yeah. is which is a, which is a shame. The other thing I was going to say to you actually was you mentioned about that it is a very theatrical film in terms of, you know, the uh, the way that you shot it and the way that it's not just you know it's not just people talking. It's actually there's a lot of as you say a lot of depth to it and everything else. But I mean the landscape itself is something to see on the the big screen. It must have been extraordinary to film in in those locations. It was fantastic. I mean, this is a town I grew up in as a child, so I know the location extremely well. <clears throat> and I knew exactly where I wanted to, to place everything. But what I didn't know was what drones can do nowadays. And that drone team, you know, I, I said to them, I, I want the, the, the shot coming over the water to Hope Gap, which is a rocky cove, really skimming low over the rocks, up the cliff to discover the town of Seaford where my characters live on the far side. So that's all grand. And then I go off to shoot something and I say, just play around while you're there, you know? And they did some incredible things. And I go, wow, I'm gonna have that shot, you know? Obviously a lot of the shots were planned, but like when she looks like she's gonna walk off the cliff and that's a drone shot and so that's all planned. But, but other stuff, these geniuses just did it. It's crazy. There was one of the, the shot you just mentioned. Did um, I have a fear of heights? So that was one of those shots where I sort of, <laughs> especially on a big screen, I might have gone, oh no, I can't, I can't deal with that. But never mind. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful, a wonderful story. And I, I, from what I've read, it's it's kind of quite personal to you. So, yeah. I mean, what was what was why what was the deciding factor in you not just writing it now, but also uh, directing it as well? Um, I, I got to a point when I wanted to direct again. I'd done it once before, and it was. A good and a bad experience. I loved doing it. I didn't love the post-production and all the rest of it. it, it we had a, I had a rather miserable time with it being recut again and again and again, actually by, by the, the late Harvey Weinstein, not that he's dead yet. But, um, so I didn't direct for 20 years and, and I now got to a point when I thought, you know what, before I die, I want to direct again. What can I do? And I wanted to do something within my limited powers as a director. And I wanted to do something that only I could do, because why, why would I not have a better director than me do a script that I've written? But this is very personal to me. Uh, it's about my breakup of my parents' marriage and, and about the, the boy I was then, age 29, dealing with that. So I thought, you know, this is mine. I know it better than anybody else. And uh, so I wrote it for myself to direct and I wrote it knowing I would shoot it in Seaford. <clears throat> and being a writer-director is quite different from just being a writer, because all the time you're thinking, where's this going to be shot? What am I going to be showing? I'm on the beach. Am I up on the concrete, but am I, am I by the beach huts? Uh, is he going to buy an ice cream? What's going to happen there? Are we going to see the tower? And it, it's a very wonderful thing to do, to write for yourself to direct. I guess it helps as well with with the because a lot of people say casting is is obviously a, a, obviously a massive part of it. And I guess for you, for something that you've written, I mean, did you have these people in mind, or did it did it help that you that you were able to cast people that you could kind of leave that to them in the sense of you could focus on your director because you knew that these three people were just going to be extraordinary as they always are. Uh, that is completely true. I mean, to be honest, the act of casting was the major directorial decision. Once brilliant actors are cast, they do it. 
I'm not sitting there saying, do this, do that. Though actually during rehearsals, we had a week of rehearsals, which is unusual, you know, for films. Um, I did amuse them a lot by saying, well, this is how I see this speech. And I would then perform it and they would all collapse with laughter. And Bill Nye has a marvelous imitation of me being his character <laughs> that he does a sort of party piece. Um, but no, they, they're fabulous actors. And that's the key for a thing like this. You get great actors and you're there. The actors aren't authentically powerful, not able to deliver emotions from inside themselves in a way that the camera very close on them is going to believe, then you're dead. So the casting was, was critical. I didn't write the script thinking these are to be the actors. I don't do that. But once it was finished and it started to be a reality, how am I going to cast it? I knew Bill Nye was a no-brainer. I mean, he is such a good actor. He's the right age. He's got all of the reticence with the emotion and, and so on underneath. Josh O'Connor, I'd never even heard of when I started. Uh, he'd recently done a film called God's Own Country. And somebody suggested him to me and I said, who's he? And they said, look at the film. So I looked at this film and it was incredible. And so I asked him to, to come in to meet and showed him the script while he read the script. He'd been offered another part, but I said, please, you know, the minute he walked in the room, the guy is, there's something very empathetic about him. And that was very important to me. You sort of love him, you know, or just being there. Um, and with Annette, I had a very narrow range because I had to cast somebody of the right age, a little bit physical appearance, you know, I didn't want to cast a sort of statuesque blonde, as it were, because my mother wasn't like that. But I needed somebody with name recognition so I could raise the money. And that's a brutal truth about filmmaking. And that narrows it down and narrows it down. And um, I'd seen, um, I've seen Annette's films, but recently I'd seen 20th Century Women, which she's fantastic in. So I just thought, you know, and I know she could do English because she'd done um, Being Julia, I think it was. So I said, let's go for her. And it was a bit of a thing getting her. At first she wasn't sure, you know, and, and I don't blame her because how does she know I'm going to deliver a decent film? Um, but, I think she took a risk, to be honest, and uh, she's kind of like that. She'll do a small project. She'd just done Captain Marvel before she did my film. <laughs> so I think she thought, well, what the hell, you know? And my golly, I'm so grateful. How is it, how is it? obviously you said it's, it's been a long time since you've directed and a lot's changed and you obviously had, uh, uh, you, you spoke there about your experiences with the, with the, with the first, the first movie, an experience that a lot of directors have unfortunately gone through over the over the decades. And I just wondered how it changed for you now. And obviously, given that indie cinema, you know, raising the funds and all of those things are so important to do that. I mean, how did you find that part of the experience going back after after so long? Much harder. Um, my my the first film I made called Firelight. Um, Fox invited me to. They said, "Why don't you try directing?" Because I'd written something for them with Jodie Foster and. Um, it hadn't occurred to me. I thought, oh, what a nice idea. Why don't I do that? Um, so I wrote it. And uh, in fact, Fox then said, we, uh, I said, I want control of the casting. And they, um, they said, well, so long as there are big enough names. And I said, I want Stephen Delane and Sophie Marceau. And they said, no, that's not going to work. So my agent took it to um, Hollywood Pictures, which was a subsidiary of Disney. And Joe Roth, then running it, said, that's fine. I'll give you $10 million to shoot it. Now, this would not happen today. So I had $10 million. Um, Hope Gap was made for four and a half million pounds, but so it's uh, much less. And raising that money was tough. It was really tough. So it's, it's just not like it used to be. The, the big studios would all kind of have these little vanity projects that they'd throw 10 million at in the hope that it would get the Oscars, you know? And uh, not there anymore, or at least not to the same degree. So it's, it's, it's hard. On the other hand, I don't have... Harvey or the equivalent leaning over me. I've got my own producer who's a dear friend of mine, David Thompson, um, who used to run BBC Films. Um, we raise the money ourselves, we have control of it ourselves. Nobody is giving me the runaround that you get, used to get. And that is so much better. Yeah, I can imagine so. Uh, just before my time runs up, I did want to ask you this. We spoke to the producers, uh, Laurie McDonald and Walker, Walter Parks last year, and they were talking about how they're excited for a Gladiator 2. Now, obviously, I know you worked on Gladiator 2, and people have their opinions as to whether 
this is a thing that should happen. It's been a long time. Do we really need a Gladiator 2? I know you worked on it. I mean, is that something that if it came across your desk, you would you would be happy to to maybe get involved in? Or do you think because of the time and because it's such a great film as a singular vision, that it should kind of be left alone? Or or would you would you happily say, you know what, I'll take a step back if it came across my desk? Uh, nobody, nobody has asked me, and I don't think they're going to ask me. So that's not a point at issue. Um, I think it's a very challenging thing to do. It doesn't mean it can't be done. They've been thinking about it for a long time. And I think they've probably come up with a solution. I don't know what it is. Um, Walter Parks is really brilliant. I mean, he's a former writer himself, and I, he was very much part of the original Gladiator. Um, so if he thinks it's going to work, I think it probably is going to work. As to do we need it? We need it if it's a great film. You know, if it's a great film, fabulous. Why not? It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, a few decades, isn't it, now, since the last one? Goodness me. Russell Crowe, everyone's got a bit older, haven't they? So. <laughs> I, I know, Russell Crowe's dead, remember? Well, he's, of course, of course, but this is, this is movies. Although Whacking Phoenix has just won an Oscar, so you never know, but who knows? Who knows what it's going to be? Uh, William, it's been an absolute delight talking to you. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, good luck with the movie when, it, when it's uh, released later in the week. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you so bye much. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey You